uh, you know, uh, I uh, I remember there was one statement by Prime Minister of Australia that he doesn't want to sit the same table with the leader of the country that invades other countries. Who does he mean? Biden? <laughs> Boris Johnson? Mm -hmm. Come on. We all we all know history, you know. But from my own point of view, if uh, some leaders, and of course they will be not the majority uh, of the leaders of G20 prefer not to come, it's their business. G20 will still be very relevant. Mm. And we really appreciate the position of Indonesia that uh, means to focus the agenda of G20 uh, on economic issues. The main thing that we've learned are lessons and the lessons is that we will never trust our Western partners again. Halo semuanya, sekarang saya duduk bersama dengan uh, Dubes Rusia untuk Indonesia, Her Excellency Madam Lyudmila Borovieva. I hope I pronounce your name right. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for making the time for us to have this discussion. There are several questions that I would like to have your comment on. Would you like to address uh, any comments regarding the suspension of Russia from the uh, UN Human Rights Council, which the UN General Assembly voted for. Is there any reaction from your government on that and how? Yes, ab absolutely. Of course, this was initiated by the United States and it's an uh, uh, unlawful and politically motivated uh, decision. Uh, on the other hand, also, how can it help to uh, solve the Ukrainian crisis uh, if uh, the a motivation uh, behind these decisions is to just punish Russia, then probably it makes sense. But the, if the motivation is to help the resolve the crisis, then it doesn't have any sense because uh, by pretending that Russia doesn't exist and is not member of uh, this or that international organization, uh, the crisis will not go away and Russia will not vanish from the world uh, map. So, uh, of course, uh, it's unfair, it's politically motivated. Actually, we are appreciative that uh, Indonesia didn't support this decision, uh, Indonesia abstained. Like many countries in the world, uh, practically half of uh, the countries didn't support uh, this decision either by abstaining voting against or not participating in the vote. So all these claims that Russia is being isolated, uh, they're actually not true. When we're talking about what's happening in Ukraine, I think uh, different perspectives occurs when you see different media, right? I think some media, especially siding with Ukraine, saying it's an invasion of Ukraine, but if we read the Russian media, it's a liberation of Ukraine. So. What do you think about this, you know, difference in perspective and it really influences how people see this whole thing? Yeah, absolutely. Words have a very important impact uh, on people as, uh, you know, it was written in the Bible, in the Bible, the word came first. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, it's very, uh, it's very important, of course. Um, of course, it's, it's not a war against Ukrainian people. It's not an invasion. We don't have, uh, we're not uh, trying to destroy Ukraine and uh, least of all Ukrainian people. Uh, it's a military operation mm -hmm. that has very well defined uh, goals and uh, targets. And uh, unfortunately, the Western media have never reported that there was a war going on in Ukraine for eight years and people were dying every day. Uh, they was bombing and shelling yeah. uh, the peaceful cities of Lugansk and Donetsk by Ukrainian army for uh, eight years. Uh, 14,000 people died. It means every day people were uh, being killed. And, and where, where are the reports by the Western media? Where mm -hmm. is all this hysterical reaction? Uh, it was just ignored by uh, the Western media community. Um, so one of the targets of this military operation is to protect the people of uh, Danyansk and Lugansk. And now it's uh, open information that uh, has been proved 
and we have documents that uh, Ukrainian side, supported by the West, were planning a massive attack on uh, Lugansk and Donetsk in March, and even maybe on Crimea. So that would have meant a much uh, larger conflict with um, more victims, uh, and uh, of course it was a direct threat to the security of uh, the Russian Federation and uh, Russian people, uh, both in Russia and, and Lugansk and Donetsk. So uh, our president has taken this very hard decision uh, to start uh, this military operation before uh, we would have become a target of a big um, military operation uh, by the Ukrainian armed forces, very much supported by the West. But no, uh, allow me to be start talking, but who the Russians want to liberate the Ukrainians from, from all these things? Because the word liberation always, you know, always written I can tell. I can tell you, from the, uh, I would say, neo-Nazi uh, groups, first of all, uh, and uh, I wouldn't say liberation, I would say protection. Protection. Okay. Protection. Because people in Lugansk and Donetsk were, uh, as I told you, they were, uh, they've been uh, attacked uh, by uh, the armed forces of Ukraine and neo-Nazi group mm. also. And it is shocking for uh, Russian that, that Nazi ideology uh, was very much supported by the government of Ukraine. You, you know, of course, that Nazi ideology is banned in, uh, in Europe, in the United States, in Russia, of course, and it was openly supported by uh, the government uh, in Ukraine. Uh, and, and the West was uh, turning a blind eye on that for, for eight years. Uh, the first thing that uh, the government in Ukraine tried to do in 2014, when it came to power after a coup d'etat, was actually to support these neo-Nazi groups and, and to uh, ban everything Russian, including Russian language. 90% of Ukrainians speak uh, Russian, and 40% of Ukrainians think of themselves as uh, ethnic Russians. How can you do that in, in a country like uh, Ukraine? Uh, so this is uh, absolutely shocking what they are and what they are doing now. Um, you know, the casual observers, when they um, see and listen the clarification from the Russian government about the presence of the neo-Nazi and the Ukrainians, um, you know, some of them f saying that it's actually who acting as an aggressor is the Russian, and they're trying to liken it to what happened in World War II, you know, and some accuse that it's actually the Russian who acting like that, not the other way around. What's your take on that? Uh, you know, uh, again, it's uh, it's the word. What words you, you use? But uh, the fact are that uh, first of all, of course, uh, for an average person, normal person, when you think about military action, when you think about war, it's it's a tragedy. No one wants war. Least of all Russians. We we know what war is. You know, together with the Ukrainians, we fought in World War Two. Uh, we lost 27 million lives, and we know what war is. We we don't want it. We don't. We want. Uh, we don't want to happen. We don't want people to die. But sometimes, in uh, in order to prevent some a bigger tragedy from happening, you need to uh, take drastic uh, measures. Of course, again, no one was. Uh, saying anything about the war that was going on for eight years in Lugansk and Donetsk. Uh, no one was showing this uh, alley of angels in, in Donetsk where children are buried, with, which were killed during this war. Or no one is showing in the uh, Western media the image of, uh, we call her the Madonna of uh, Borlovka. It's a photo of a young girl killed by a Ukrainian army lying in a pool of blood with her baby in 2014. It was not shown in, in just a single uh, Western uh, media. So, uh, of course, we needed to stop that, finally, because there was no intention from the Ukrainians to stop that. Actually, we tried to do it in, with diplomatic means. For eight years, we've been pushing Kiev to fulfill the Minsk agreements. Mm -hmm. We were uh, the ones who initiated the Minsk agreements. We tried to 
uh, and we managed to urge the leaders of Lugansk and Donetsk and the Kiev sit together and find a way, find a solution, and a solution was found. But uh, Kiev uh, did not uh, fulfill their commitments, and they were very much supported again by the United States and uh, their allies. But by sending the troops, some people said that it's actually the Russians who violated the Minsk Agreement. We were not part of the Minsk Agreements. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> How can we violate them? Yeah. Uh, and, one th and one last thing about this, um, you know, there's, an, there's a lot of allegations and cries about the allegations of war crimes committed in Ukraine by the Russian troops. Any comment on that, Madam Ambassador? Uh, absolutely not true. Absolutely not true. You know, I, I'm Russian. Uh, and I was born in, in Ukraine. I know the feeling that Russians have towards Ukrainians. We don't have any hatred. Mm -hmm. We don't have any, any animosity towards Ukraine. We do understand that, unfortunately, Ukrainians uh, are being used as an instrument. And they've been brainwashed for many years in believing that we're their enemies. Our, on the contrary, actually, our armed forces are trying to spare civilian population. Uh, Wherever our uh, armed forces come, they bring humanitarian assistance, they distribute uh, water and food, uh, they open humanitarian passages trying to evacuate a civilian population. Now we have around one million refugees from, we do accept people from, from Ukraine. Uh, and all these fakes uh, distributed in, 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 in the Western media, they are absolutely terrible. On the contrary, we have uh, facts and documents showing that uh, Ukrainian uh, troops torture and uh, kill uh, prisoners. They kill uh, their own civilian population. They use uh, houses uh, as uh, uh, they, they, they put their military equipment in the houses where they are just uh, uh, civilians living. They are using civilians as a life uh, shield. Uh, you know, there are some people saying that the, our operation is going to slow and that shows that we are failing. It's not true. We are being careful. We could have progressed much uh, quicker, but what we're trying to do is to spare the, the civilians. Um, I'm going to touch um, the topics on the G20 summit this year because Indonesia are hosting the summit. And, also, and of course, one of the problems right now for the international community is about whether Russia, whether President Putin is coming or not to Bali in October. Well, is he coming in the message? <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> uh, well, uh, I can tell you that uh, the invitation has been issued and it was received and uh, our president has expressed his intent to, uh, to be present at the G20 uh, summit. Uh, well, for you know, my opinion, first of all, that if there are countries that are trying to prevent that from happening, and trying to boycott uh, the meeting. Actually, it's their business. If they don't come, it's uh, then. Uh, I think it's it's quite again. It's it's quite uh, you know um, cowardly position. Okay, you try to pretend that Russia doesn't exist. Uh, Russia exists, mm. and whatever they're trying to pretend is not is not true. Uh, you know. Uh, I uh, I remember there was one statement by uh, Prime Minister of Australia that he doesn't want to sit at the same table with the leader of the country that invades other countries. Who does he mean? Biden? <laughs> Boris Johnson? Mm -hmm. Come on, we all we all know history, you know. So uh, even from my point of view, I'm I'm not expressing the official position of my government, but from my own point of view, if uh, some leaders, and of course they will be not the majority uh, of the leaders of G20, prefer not to come, it's their business. G20 will still be very relevant. Mm. And we really appreciate the position of Indonesia that uh, means to focus the agenda of G20 uh, on economic issues, and, and they are very important, of course. Uh, it's the, we support the priorities of G20 presidency, 
uh, it's the recovery of the economy after COVID pandemic, it's the strengthening of the healthcare system, it's the digital transformation, it's the energy transformation. These are issues that are very important. And G20 is not the forum to uh, discuss political crisis. It's the forum that should concentrate on global financial and economic problems that are very numerous. On the G20 thing, I think we, the Indonesian people, are leaving it to the government to decide, you know, but I think we're not very keen on being told what to do, right, by other countries. So Absolutely. I think you understand that position as well. Uh, your foreign minister, Mr. Landorf, met with our foreign minister in China. True. Is there any advancement between our country since that meeting and what's the outcome from that meeting? Can you share with us? Uh, I think uh, many issues have been discussed during this uh, meeting, bilateral issues, uh, G20, of course, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, I think positions have been stated from uh, both uh, sides. Uh, the meeting was quite recent, so uh, I would say that there are any new developments. Uh, Regarding in the information war and campaign, uh, there are also a lot of allegations against the Russians, right? Absolutely. I think uh, there's, an, uh, there's an allegation that the Russian government are running digital campaigns on various countries, including Indonesia. That's why there's a lot of, you know, sympathies from Indonesian people towards the Russia. Is that true that the Russian government have this orchestrated digital information campaign all across the world? What do you mean a digital campaign? If you mean cyber attacks, it's not true. <laughs> Again, no, it's not cyber no attacks, but, but, but to create positive sentiments in the local internet. That's why if we are looking at Indonesian TikToks, there's a lot of you know kids saying "ura," there's kids saying you know they they like the Russians. Is that something um, created or designed? Absolutely not. Uh, absolutely not. Uh, what we're trying to do is we are telling the truth mm -hmm. actually, and we're trying to explain our position. If it's uh, well met in uh, Indonesia and, and many other countries in the world, actually. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's, it's, it's not that we are trying to orchestrate something. It's just, uh, I think, very normal feelings of uh, people who understand the real root of this conflict. Um, what do you want to see more from the Indonesian government in addition to what has been done so far you know, to help resolve these things in Ukraine? Is there anything more that we can do? Just government. not to give in to the Western pressure, <laughs> the, to be impartial, mm -hmm. to uh, for the G20 to just concentrate on the agenda that has been already agreed upon, and uh, not to give not to give in to this terrible pressure that has been uh, applied not only to Indonesia but to many countries in the world. Uh, we do appreciate the. Uh, free and active uh, foreign policy of Indonesia. Where do Russia see themselves in the map of global power these days? Because from the way I see it, it's about Russia want to be like the leader of the rest against the Western hegemony. Is that true, Madam Ambassador? No, I wouldn't put it that way. Uh, it's not about leadership against Western hegemony. It's just opposing Western hegemony. Uh, we don't agree uh, that uh, just a small group of countries uh, have the right to dictate their will to the whole world. And uh, we don't agree uh, that these countries are using economy, information, uh, military uh, power as a... Uh, instrument of uh, attacking other countries. We are not the only country that uh, are, uh, have been targeted by, by the West. Uh, you, uh, everyone remembers Yugoslavia in 1999, everyone remembers Iraq, Libya, Syria, or Afghanistan, actually. We don't agree with the world order that allows things like that to happen. That's why we don't agree with the concept of the uh, rules-based uh, world order promoted by the West, because the problem with this concept is that the rules are written in Washington and Brussels, and other countries don't have any part in that. 
the, the rules are not written by China or Russia or by Indonesia. It's, it's written by Washington and Brussels. Why do we have to follow these rules? Uh, and uh, we already have a set of rules. It's international law, it's uh, UN Charter, but we see how international law and UN Charter are being ignored. Uh, by the West, and it didn't happen in February, it happened a long time ago. Still in regard to the information and, and PR scope, Madam Ambassador, uh, I think the President of Ukraine has been engaging in, in, in several PR campaigns. You know, I think the latest one is, is being shown with the British Prime Minister Boris Johnson walking around in Kiev, while some people said that President Putin in Moscow, not doing anything publicly. Is that the style that the Russian government is, you know, is doing? That's the way the Russian does their diplomacy behind the closed door, so you know, people don't see that? Or do you not think that it's necessary to engage in a you know, PR campaign to gain sympathies from the international community? Yeah. Well, you know, it's, it's, it's it's even, I, I even cannot compare, you know, the mm -hmm. two styles because, mm -hmm. uh, you know, <laughs> President Zelensky, you know his background, you know, he's, uh, uh, what do you suggest that uh, President Putin invite Boris Johnson to Moscow and, and walks around the, the streets of Moscow. Uh, you know that our president has uh, engaged in a lot of meetings and conversations with the Western uh, leaders. Mm -hmm. uh, I think even today that he's meeting with the uh, Chancellor of Austria. Austria. Uh, so, uh, and it is well known. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, of course, uh, as the Western media are in the hands of the Western governments, it's not being shown. Uh, even I think even if you walked in the streets of Moscow with the chancellor, it wasn't, wouldn't have uh, uh, meant anything. You know, this kind of uh, PR campaigns, uh, I don't know whether, how, how really uh, effective uh, yeah. they are. Uh, it, it's not about walking in the streets. Yeah. It's about what, what uh, the substance of yeah. these uh, meetings mm -hmm. are. Yeah, so uh, it's it's. I I wouldn't even try to compare the, 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 these two styles. I think what I'm what I'm about to, uh, trying to say is, you know, some countries that they try to portray their countries as benevolent as good. I think some countries in the Middle East, for instance, you know, they they're trying to to reestablish a new portrait of their countries, but. I don't think that you know the Russian government and Russia as a country really cares about what the other countries think of them as long as it suits your national interest. Uh, interesting question. Uh, oh, well, uh, you know what we care about. It's not the image that is being uh, produced in uh, of Russia in, in Western media because uh, what we already see for uh, you know. For, for more than a decade, it's always bad. Anything bad happens in the world, Russia uh, is behind. It's not what we really care about. It's, uh, of course, we would like to reach to, to the public of uh, uh, countries, but, uh, I, um, you know, the, 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 the Western world is not the whole world. Basically, uh, there are many countries that we see uh, don't have uh, this, uh, Russophobic uh, policies, and what we care about is having good relations with other countries. Uh, we are open for dialogue and uh, cooperation in the interest of uh, the people of uh, uh, our countries. Of course, we do understand that the public has influence on, on the governments, of course, uh, and uh, that's why we're trying to explain the reasons and the motivation against this uh, uh, beside this uh, military operation that we're conducting uh, in Ukraine. But I'm sure that at the end, uh, people do understand what is really happening. Oh, one final question from an ambassador. Um, after all these things ended, and hopefully it's going to end soon, where do you see the position of Russia you know, uh, globally 
with the prediction of the economy of Russia going to punch, I think, by 11%. And of course, about the condemnation from the other countries. Is Russia going to be a paria, you think, in the uh, international community? Absolutely not. Mm -hmm. uh, well, what do you mean by international community? If, if like you, UN, for instance? Uh, uh, no, of course uh, and not. And trade or not? No, no. If you mean just, uh, you know, uh, European Union and the United States, well, but uh, they are not the whole world. Mm. You know, we uh, have China as our strategic partner. We have very good relations with ASEAN countries, including Indonesia. We have good relations with Latin American, African countries, with Middle Eastern countries. And uh, I hope more and more countries will understand what, what we are uh, doing. And, uh, but uh, the main thing that we've learned our lessons, and the lessons is that we will never trust our Western partners again. We will be more. We will rely more on ourselves, uh, on our own potential. And Russia has a great potential. We are very rich in uh, natural resources. We are. We have a developed agriculture, which is actually the result of the sanctions that have been imposed in 2014. Because before 2014, we were very much dependent on uh, food imports uh, from abroad, uh, not anymore. We, on the contrary, we uh, became number one wheat e exporter, together with Ukraine, actually. Uh, we export beef, we export chicken. So uh, no more dependent on, on uh, foreign partners on that. So uh, how can you trust uh, people who uh, they say they freeze your um, central bank assets, but in fact it's stealing mm. <laughs> central bank um, assets? Uh, how can you believe uh, uh, partners that, OK, central bank assets are government assets, but why they are stealing property of uh, private, you know, private property of Russian nationals. Mm -hmm. Why is that? Where, where is the legal basis? Mm -hmm. uh, how can that be? You know, it's, it's absolutely Ill illegitimate. So uh, we don't have trust anymore. We will be more self-reliant. We will be more uh, self-sufficient and of course, I'm sure we will be more looking towards Asia-Pacific region. You mentioned one interesting thing that your lesson is not to trust the Western partners. Mm -hmm. Are you in a position to actively encouraging other countries to do the same? I think, you know, uh, we're not encouraging anyone. <laughs> uh, but, you know, you just look at what is happening. Mm -hmm. I think it is evident. You know, how can you trust people who just, and we are not the only country in this position, have uh, ever uh, Western countries returned something they've taken? No. Iran, Afghanistan, yeah. Venezuela, uh, Cuba, North Korea, they just seize these assets and they will never be seen again. And in plain words, it's just theft, of course. So uh, I think other countries should look at this situation and, and um, make their own conclusions. Madam Ambassador, thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Enlightening discussion. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you so much.